What's up guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. And today we have another piece of content focused on the precious metal sector. I know we've done that a lot this week, but coincidentally, I am sitting on a lot of precious metal stocks and I tend to use this channel relatively selfishly. So my guest today is the founder and CEO of Soar Financial. His name is Kai Hoffman. Soar Financial is a publishing business focused on the junior mining sector. Kai is also the founder of a company called Orin Inc., a data company that tracks the financings of junior mining companies specific to the sector that I pay the most attention of on, which is companies under 1.5 billion market cap who are raising less than 100 million. Those early stage opportunities that I like to focus on. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. We really drilled into you know, the amount of cash that was raised last year, the amount of cash that was raised this year is hitting records, yet the sentiment in the sector is at all time lows. And so what does that mean to him in terms of what may happen next? Lots of cash in the treasuries, healthy balance sheets, all time low sentiment and valuation. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Now, three things before we jump in. Number one, if you want to subscribe to my weekly newsletter, there's a pinned comment beneath this video where you can do so. It's free and super easy to do. I'd love to have you join the team. Number two, the advertising revenue of this channel is now donated to an organization super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. And the way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing, employment training, and just generally great influences on their life. The natural world can be so therapeutic and I love what these guys are doing so check them out if you're interested number three if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast just search for the jay martin show all right here is kai hoffman enjoy i assemble the smartest people i can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation and that's exactly what i've done today please give my panel a round of applause welcome Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Kai Hoffman, finally, the CEO of Soar Financial. Kai, it's about time we had you on the show. How are you doing? Not too bad, Jay. Yeah, it's long overdue. I haven't seen you and spoke to you in ages, so it's great to see you. Yes, it is. So right before I hit record, well, first of all, for anybody who's not familiar with yourself or who Soar is, give us the high-level overview. Who are you and what do you spend your time doing, Kai? Yeah, no, a pleasure. Appreciate it. Uh, so Soar Financial Group is pretty much a conglomerate of three smaller companies. One is a PR firm, Soar Financial Partners. The other one is a data analysis company, Orin Inc., where we track all the financings in the junior mining sector, giving us a lot more credibility than uh, just on the PR side, right? Because uh, numbers don't lie. And then we also have a small publishing house out in Germany where we just publish on a blog just regularly on, on mining matters. And uh, yeah, that's that, that's us. A uh, lot of site visits. Like we run SF Live. You see the logo behind me. Uh, just just on top of things i like the logo okay so yeah right before i hit record you said you've been traveling too much right and so i could assume you're doing diligence on projects is that right yeah exactly and uh, we put a tour together recently <clears throat> i just came back from sweden on sunday and we're recording this on wednesday so uh, uh I, I still feel the trip in my, in my bones got it all right all right so so talk to me about uh about your diligence process kai uh what do you look for what do you look at and what do you need to see before you take the next step well, what I like about site visits, and I've said that before, is like you, you actually get to spend a lot of time with management, right? Uh, and that, that that's really key. Like, of course, we look at the project first. Is it even of interest? Like, if it's in the middle, like, or I would say in the middle of nowhere, but if it's in a, in a let's say, commodity that we don't care about, like we don't look at lithium personally, like that's just not something we're, we're strong in. So, okay. so we disregard that. So usually the project takes a number of boxes before we even put the effort in to go on a site visit. But then it really comes down to the due diligence. Like I'm not a geologist or engineer. So for me, it's it's the superficial things actually. Like how does the management present itself? How is it to be around them for 24, 48 hours? How do they interact with the locals? Like you know, that that's ESG to, to a certain degree. Um, how does that factor in, right? Do they have a social license to actually operate? Do people stop by and say hello, or do they just drive by, look at you angry, and uh, move on with their life, right? Um, th that's what I look for on a site visit. And then that trickles down to management for me, which is really, really key. Interesting. Yeah, I love that take. It's like an anecdotal approach to, uh, to uh, governance issues, potentially, right? Because you're, you're getting to know the players a little bit. You know what? I, so I, my approach is like people over everything every single time. Anybody who watches my stuff knows that. That's what I harp. Uh, and I actually got got attacked on Twitter recently for somebody 
uh, comparing my investment style to, in his words, that of a 13 year old schoolgirl. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but he, you know, he's saying if you're only focusing on the people, you're missing the important details, right? A funny analogy that he drew, but regardless, talk to me about, about what you, why you focus that way, Kai. It's interesting because I, I can't influence the rocks, right? But I had that discussion with uh, with an investor recently in Quebec as well. We sat together in the car for like seven, eight hours. And he's like, for him, project comes first. I was like, but well, how are you going to get the project across the finish line if you can't finance it? And I named him three projects top of my head that are sitting at a financing like hurdle right now to get into production and they're not getting financed. So it makes you wonder, why is that? That's when you start looking into management. Like mm. the project can take you this far. Like you can have an exact uh, exceptional project, but if you can't get it financed, how are you going to benefit from it? Like it might be the best project, but it's worthless if you can't ex extract value from it in the form of having a decent management team around it that helps you extract that value. Yeah, I think you hit on something really important. You said I'm not an engineer, right? Because my thoughts are the most important thing we can all do is determine what kind of investor we are, right? And and figure out what our strengths are so that we can play to those, right? Now, a different from you, well, similar to you, I focus on people and I probably do it in a different way, but it's because I have conversations for a living, right? <laughs> and in a previous life, I hosted investment conferences, right? And, and one day again, we'll do that. <laughs> and so my access to people supersedes anything else I can touch. And I'm not an engineer and I'm not a geologist, right? And so that's why I land there. The other reason that I like it is because that's a very accessible way to approach diligence for most people, right? We, we can relate to people, right? But, you know, a trap that we fall into, Kai, so frequently is, is the loudest and the spendiest promoters are often the most nefarious characters, right? But they're in your face and they're on your desk with the newest opportunity. So what can you share with uh, my audience as retail investors, Kai, when they're looking at deals that are continually hitting their screens, coming at them from this contact and that contact? You know, how can we look behind the curtain as simply as possible and, and get to a no soon? That, that's a good question because that requires quite a bit of details because oftentimes those nefarious promoters are trying to hide the fact that it's massively promoted, meaning they paid other sources to sort of pump their deal. Sure. Right? So especially here in Canada, like US is a bit different. They have a bit like, in my opinion, slightly better disclosure rules, especially when it comes to like online and YouTube marketing and social media marketing, where you have a bit better disclosure when it means like, hey, I've been paid for by this company. So that, that's the first step. I, I go look at the disclaimer and uh, if they're a decent outlet or at least if they're worth their salt, they, they put in there that they've been paid for. And then usually they put in there who they've been paid for. <clears throat> and that's yeah. when you can start going down the rabbit hole. Right. So that's when you start looking, OK, maybe it was company X, Y, Z that paid them for it. Maybe it wasn't the company itself. And then you can go find 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 more behind it. And then, of course, you got to make I, I use social media a lot. So you just go on social media and you try to find more about uh, find more out about these people. Go on their LinkedIn profile. Like one, one big red flag for me is also is like the CEO sort of stops talking about a project that he's been involved in like three, four years ago. Like not stops talking, he just erases it from his CV. Mm. Right. Those are, those are certain things like very simple, simple, like due diligence approach. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Just make sure the story is coherent. Right. And, and it's telling like there might be like maybe some of the loudest dogs, like maybe the, the they bark the loudest. But sometimes you need to keep in mind they also need to finance. Mm. Right. So like I'm not completely adverse. It sounds like I'm super negative on, on all the promotion and everything. But promotion actually serves a purpose to a degree. If you can finance at a higher price, keep dilution down, you're actually creating value. Right. The question is like how much is spent on promotion go take a look at a balance sheet and see if the promotional part the marketing activities actually match the gna slash the exploration spending mm. if there's a disconnect in mining and you have way more marketing spend than exploration spend there's no value being created besides on the stock market meaning like you're being fleeced for your dollars right yeah that's a really good point too because I, I exactly i don't mean to throw any buddy under the bus for having a healthy marketing spend in fact i advocate for that because as a shareholder, I want to make sure the CEO I've invested in is telling the market about what they're doing, right? It's, it's not enough to get to work and produce results. If you don't tell the market about it, it's all for naught as a public company. No, exactly. It's like you, there, there's a healthy way to do it. And there's a discussion about what, what should be the, the ratio of exploration dollars to marketing dollars. I think that's, that's, that varies. Mm -hmm. But uh, just make sure they actually create value in the ground as well. Like, what, what are they telling you? It's like, are they actually creating let's say they're drilling their plan is to drill ten thousand meters but there's no dollars going into the ground like it's all going into the marketing spend 
that's when you should be very, very careful. I've seen that, unfortunately, too many times. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As we all have. Okay. Now, I want to dive into uh, Orin Inc., your data company, for a minute. Kai, talk to me with a little bit more depth about what, you know, what we'll find, you know, at Orin Inc., what you guys do, and then maybe touch on any, any key trends or, or points of activity that are piquing your interest right now. Yeah, no, appreciate that. So Orin Inc., we track 1,400 companies pretty much on the TSX, TSXV, and the CSE. And what we track is their financing activity. So we track companies with a market cap below $1.5 billion and $100 million worth of financings or smaller. Everything else is too yeah. big. It destroys our index as well that we come out with every Monday. And to that index sort of tells you on a weekly basis how the industry is doing. Right. So we could see, like, are we raising a lot of money? Like, are the brokers active? Are there being bought deals? done and th that's key so in some of the trends i see right now and uh, it's quite puzzling and maybe it's a good sign that we have a green day in the markets today but uh, we've raised a lot of money this year already in the sector um in the junior mining sector we raised over 5.1 billion dollars so my, my question i posed the other day on twitter as well like why does it feel like 2015 again like all the companies have money like the sentiment shouldn't be as bad as it is right now like in 2015 we only raised 2.4 billion dollars over the whole year and by September 10th or 15th, I think was the last number uh, when I took a poll, it was $5.1 billion. Last year in total was 5.5, and that was the biggest year ever since 2011. So we're on track to beat the, the highest, uh, like last year, actually. Mm. And, and that's a trend I'm, uh, I'm witnessing as well. And one thing I'm seeing as well, it's not just gold, silver, and, uh, gold and silver, the precious metals attracting dollars. It's, it's other commodities now as well that are making up some of that uh, commodity mix as well, like copper, even lithium to a degree, uranium has been a big factor as well. Okay, so a couple of threads I want to pull on there, uh, potentially going to set a record in financing this year. Uh, thanks for providing context. You said, was it 2.4 billion-ish in 2015? Was that the number? Did I get that That's right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so there's some good context for us because uh, if you've been in the industry long enough, maybe you remember the sentiment in 2015. It was pretty depressing out there. Uh, and and maybe it feels like that today, actually. Uh, you know, I, I shared uh, in a previous conversation, I had a handful of uh, chats with people who were at Denver uh, or Beaver Creek, you know, the, the investment conferences in Colorado in September. And that's how they would describe it, right? Depressing sentiment, all time low sentiment, right? What you're saying is, but these companies have cash in the bank. And so are you seeing, therefore, healthier balance sheets, Kai? Um, and we could expect like a just a surge in news flow over the next 18 months or what does that tell you, right? The money's in the treasury, right? But you're not seeing the market respond. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, it, it means a lot because we can create value now. Like companies actually have money to create value. And uh, also the average deal the, the average deal size was over $5 million. That means a lot of less smaller financings are being done. Meaning yeah. like, the, like in 2015, we've seen a lot of like three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 financings just to keep the lights on and be able to pay the auditors and the, and yeah. the exchange to stay listed. Yeah. Right yeah. now we're seeing bigger financings, bigger tool programs being financed, bigger development projects are being financed. Th that means value is being created. Which, which is massive for the sector. And I think we, we will see that. I know like even still from the summer, a lot of companies are sitting or waiting for drill results. And uh, that's creating value as well. Of course, not all drill campaigns are gonna be hugely successful, but that's the game. But uh, at least they're trying to create value that way, right? Uh, coming out with further studies, PFS or pre-feasibility studies um, to, to show that value in the ground. So that all sounds positive. Why do you think the sentiment is so horrible at this moment? I, I think that's macro driven. Like, to be honest, gold is not sexy right now. Uh, if you have the interest free environment, pretty much that we're in, you don't have to worry about the gold sector to, to hedge your bets in the main markets. If you can make your 25, 30 percent every year in the S&P, why bother? Like I'm like I'm exaggerating, like, but why bother? Um, when, when we, we need a scare in the main market to, to get the, some of the 401k money maybe out of the US back into the, the, the juniors or into the mining sector in general. Valuations are super attractive. If you look at the producers, like some of the cash flow or dividend yields are uh, often, they can actually start competing with some of the bigger blue chip companies in the US as well. Newmont, 3.8%, Barrick, because they're paying special dividends, about 4.5 to 4.8%. That's a great dividend yield. And you get mm. the gold hedge as well. That that like the overall market sentiment is weighing on gold. Like you don't really need gold right now for your portfolio. 
which is sounds very negative, but it's it's a true statement, unfortunately. Well, it, it's actually great news. I think it's great news, right? Because I'm I'm more pleased with my precious metals holdings than maybe ever before because I love the names that I'm positioned in. Uh, they haven't generated phenomenal returns or any returns yet, but the market is calm and undervalued, and so you have the benefit of you can be patient, right? And you can wait for prices to come to you. Easier said than done, but you know, when you have those opportunities to part cash in an industry that you believe, you know, time horizon, you know, one, three, five years, whatever that looks like, but you can own these, these the best names in the business with the management teams that have put the puck in the net three, four times, right? That's where you wanna be. And then it's just a waiting game. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's a great opportunity right now. We actually the last few days, like I've been watching the screens a bit, like some of the stocks are already up 20% from their lows. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of trading happening. There's a bit of a rebound trade happening. We'll, we'll see how far that takes us. Uh, I don't think it'll take us far enough. So I'm, for some reason, I'm quite negative, uh, which I shouldn't mm -hmm. be because I'm also a big gold investor. All my portfolio is, is engineer mining stocks mostly, which is a bit moronic, but uh, that's what it is. But uh, um, because I'm expecting tax loss season still to hit. I know some of the retail guys have taken some of the, pro uh, the tax losses already, but the funds haven't started selling yet. So that's something we will have to, to watch out for. Um, that's something that uh, sort of like the, the Damocles sword. I'm not sure if that saying exists in English as well. It's just hanging over us mm. um, that we have to watch like bef before I get too bullish and excited again. It might exist in English, but I'm not familiar with it. What's the so, what's like? The there's always a sword hanging over you. It's like it's a you. I think it's Greek mythology. It's like don't quote me on it properly, but it's like always a sword hanging over you that's just waiting to cut your throat. Okay. So yeah. right. So that's sort of like tax loss selling and tax loss season for for me in mining right now. Okay, I'm gonna look that up. I love it. <laughs> love analogies like that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kai. Now um, another another thread I want to pull in pull on on the you know. The financings that have occurred to date. Um, how does that so 5.1 million raised in in your market and your market being if I heard you correctly, companies with a market cap sub 1.5 billion and raises sub 100 million, right? That's the area you yeah. focus on perfect because when it comes to precious metals, that's the area I focus on. So we're looking at 5.1 million billion raised within that market segment this year. Does that lead you to have any beliefs or speculations about future M&A activity, Kai? It, it should, because we're still working on projects to get to a certain, let's say, takeout level. There's not too many around that you could say, okay, this one is going to be the next one. Like there's maybe three or four that come to mind, but the pipeline itself is fairly empty. So I'm hoping that money is being used to create and fill that pipeline. Like I used to write a newsletter back in 15, 16 as well, and you could just say this one, that one, that one you can just go through the list and say okay they're ripe but it feels much thinner out there right now in terms of deal pipeline and MA pipeline um mm -hmm. we're seeing a couple of deals like coming out of like Kirtland lake and uh Ignigo eagle merging so i'm curious to see if there's if there's any fallout i know like mills like uh, like the the facilities like holt and uh, holloway for example i'm not sure if that still fits the bill uh but it's still there's quite a bit of mine life left as well so i'm curious to see like my point is like are we going to see some fallouts out of the bigger transactions that some of the smaller companies will be able to gobble up to create a second to, to to create some newer mid-tier companies okay okay and any certain activity you think the market needs to see before that before that before those targets increase in number is it is it drill results like what's the catalyst going to be do you think that's a good question. Like I, I watched a Kitco interview the other day, and I hate to quote the competition to a degree, but uh, like Mark Bristol <laughs> was, was interviewed, and I really I was intrigued by what he said because it gave me a food for thought. It was like, well, we got our own like brownfields exploration of five to seven years, a pipeline of five to seven years to explore on our ground. We don't have to buy anything. Like we can be opportunistic, of course, if an opportunity comes along, but we don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Right, and I th it feels like some of the majors, like in Newmont, I haven't heard anything from them um, over recent months, years, almost like ever since the Nevada um, Nevada gold mines deal with Barrick, they've been really, really quiet. So, quite curious, like what's shaping up behind the scenes. But I, I don't really see a trigger. I'm not sure if eighteen hundred gold is why is that not a trigger? But then again, eighteen dollar, hundred dollar gold plays against us because all of a sudden, all the internal projects are worth way more, and it's worth exploring and doing that brownfields exploration. So that's. It's a two-edged sword there in that regard as well. Got it. Got it. And I love Kitco, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> good guys. So there we are. All right. Um, uh, now, talking to the investor, Kai, you know, 
Has your perspective on jurisdictional risk shifted at all in the last maybe three years? It has, like, it, it has and it has not. Of course, I'm still not going to the typical places like that I just don't feel comfortable in, right? Yeah. Um, but then it's like, then again, there's areas like in BC or even in, uh, in, in Nevada or Arizona, like that's also jurisdictional risk that you have to pay, like, pay attention to like now with a like a new president in in, in the u.s like th there are shifts so that i pay more attention to before like maybe it was easier to say okay u.s is a no-brainer projects are gonna get permitted but that's that that has changed like i think esg factors in big time as well which is playing a big role in that and that's worldwide it doesn't matter where you are uh that social license to operate that i mentioned before it it, it is different from place to place so there could be great jurisdictions within the u.s or in peru well, same country, different different story, right? Mm. And uh, so, yeah, you have to weigh your options there carefully, like if you weigh your opportunities carefully. Okay. Now, breaking down various commodities, I know you, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you focus on gold, silver, copper, and you watch uranium. Is that accurate? Yes, I, I just, like, from, from a distance. Like I'm not, like I'm still trying to figure out what the supply side looks like in uranium. Okay. And okay. Uh, trying to figure out where everything is coming from. I have I don't have the transparency there because um, I haven't done, I haven't taken the deeper dive to be honest. Okay, so we could say uh, gold, silver, copper. It, primarily. Okay, we had to take a quick minute there. We had a camera issue, but we're back. Um, so Kai, we were talking about the uranium sector. Uh, you watch from a distance. Now get into some more granular details for me. Copper, silver, gold. Do any of those three? provide uh get you more excited if you're thinking about the near term right kai so 2021 2022 right these three commodities which three do you think will generate the most most returns for investors uh oh good question Spot, like uh, uranium is like i don't see where the ceiling is yet like uh, I, I mentioned before like i don't see where the supply is coming from i, I have that feeling that all of a sudden there's going to be a flood of additional supply like maybe old uh, mines coming back online on stream like i haven't taking a deeper deeper dive like on really where the uranium is coming from that sprot is buying right now like sure. they're buying massive amounts of pounds every single day so where where is that actually coming from like it's got to be somewhere physically right yeah. um short short term like i, I do like copper midterm and short term maybe probably silver like could, could be quite interesting in terms of percentage gains um we, we, it has been beaten quite a bit lately uh i'm not a silver bug or anything by any means but uh, if we look at percentage gains and you asked me to year end uh I, I think silver could definitely outperform while copper midterm is more interesting in my opinion Okay. Now, talk to me about how you may approach a copper exploration project, Kai, versus how you might approach a gold exploration project. Because, you know, on the surface, we see similar management teams approach these projects, but the exit strategies are vastly, vastly different. So talk to me about how the differences that you focus on or how you approach those. Yeah, the management team is probably the the right one. Like copper and and gold, copper gold, copper just or just gold. There is a difference. Like it's more on the industrial side, the copper. So what kind of context does the management team come with? If they're just old, uh, let's say, college style explorers that are all of a sudden looking for copper gold, maybe in BC, that might not be the management team I want to back. Like if the management team comes actually with a, a tracker, maybe they've been with tech before. Like of course everybody can say that, but it depends on where and how, and maybe they've done some some. They had some relationships maybe with some of the bigger traders like a Clancore, a Trafigura. Uh, I, I give those people definitely more props than uh, maybe just an explorer, or just a geo that has an idea that he tries to con uh, convert into a, a project. Okay. Now, um, I don't know if you're comfortable. I'd love you to share some names that you're excited about. Kind of. We always got to well, pull on this one. So, uh, copper, gold, silver, uh, exploration development companies that have you super interested right now. Any come to mind? Yeah, no, I, I got to talk my own book here because um, sure. I'm a. I'm super stoked with, as you said, like you, you said it perfectly. It could have come out of my mouth. Like I'm super stoked with what I hold in my personal portfolio, but then I'm also super stoked with the companies we work with. So we got to put that on there because uh, I own my own clients. So that's that's important as well. Um, th there's various that come to mind, like maritime resources, for example, out of uh, Newfoundland, uh, permitted project, seventy thousand ounce potential, start of production potentially next year. Uh, or end of 2022, uh, the Hammerdown project. That's one I'm looking at very, very closely, trading at about 14 and a half cents. Uh, that's a market cap of 
60 million roughly <laughs> yeah, i've got to get a look that up. i've checked this morning so i uh, got to look that up but everybody's been having a good day this morning so um yeah. that, that's been going well dory copper is another one that comes to mind I actually was just at their facility outside of shibugamu um that's an interesting one they're running a hub and spoke model just outside there it's shibugamu small town in northern quebec and uh, they have a number of projects they put out a couple resource estimates for their projects corner bay one and uh, the analysts seem to like it as well uh, Cormark updated or just recently increased their target price to $2.30, quite positive. NPV has been going up as well. That's something that could come into production also within 24, maybe 28 months as well. And mm -hmm. that's something I look forward to. It's like, that's also an exit strategy for me. Like, as I, as like it sort of trickles down from Orin Inc. as well. Like, what, what do we look for? Well, it's, if it gets too big, it's not of interest to us. We, how, do, how do you make money? Right? Yeah. Like, I'm not in for 20%, I have to admit. Like, we're playing this junior mining game for a bit more. So, yeah. No, those I names that. like i mentioned do have that potential okay appreciate that now do you do you have a position in uh in any crypto opportunities sky i do not no do not? that's no i do not. I, I watch it i find it interesting what's going on in the bitcoin space mm -hmm. uh, i think it's quite complementary to what we're doing uh once that hype is gone it reminds me a bit of the, the cannabis uh hype early on where even the ceos were running around in those uh, botic like lsd shirts and yeah. i had a hard time taking them serious but a couple serious companies emerged from that so uh, that's why i'm watching from the sidelines before i put my money to, to to use got it okay so you've not felt compelled to have a horse in the race in any of the cryptocurrencies so far not yet i have a hard time putting a dollar value to it like i, I, I have a hard time coming up with a target price for bitcoin is it hundred thousand two hundred thousand is it thirty thousand like i have a hard time and uh, there's a lot of unknowns like a lot of unknown like wallets of bitcoin owners as well so i don't like the unknown in that regard yeah it's a speculative play and you can make money with it and i'm like i have friends personal friends that made the fortune <laughs> in, in bitcoin like all the best to them like they took the risk they got rewarded love it all right all right, I love that. Guy, anybody who wants to find out more about what you do, where should we point them to? Yeah, sorefinancial.com, the website that just sort of links directly to the three companies we're involved in. Twitter, really active on Twitter, at sorefinancial. And you can find us on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash sorefinancial. All right, great. And um, are we going to see you, Kai, at the uh, VRIC conference in Vancouver, January 16th and 17th? Yes, we are. We are. I really appreciate the invitation. Looking forward to it already. It's time to have a bigger conference again in Vancouver. So I, I think the industry is stoked about it from what I've been hearing. So looking forward Love to it. it. Love it, man. I'm looking forward to it as well. Okay. I look forward to seeing you there in person, Kai, if not beforehand. It was great catching up. About the time we had you on the show. So thanks so much. And I'd love to do it again sometime. Appreciate it, Jay. Thanks so much. Okay, guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.